a big part of my research involved the monitoring of plants. Um, I'd wire electrodes to different kinds of plants over a long period of time, and I would watch how certain markers or indicators would flux in relation to things like time and other kinds of uh, stimuli. Uh, and so what I noticed, for instance, was that um, things like moon or lunar phases, the actual physical change of the moon in the sky, uh, would have an effect on things like a potato. If I had a potato wired up to an, you know, a voltmeter uh, over a long period of time, that, that, little, that little guy would seem to have an idea as to what was going on in the sky. Interestingly, NASA, in one of their space shuttles, replicated something along that basic experiment. Um, they went, flew a shuttle up into orbit and stuck a, a bunch of meters into a potato and whenever they would reorient the craft, that potato would fluctuate and it seemed to know where the moon was. I saw that playing out in my own lab in different ways. Um, and so uh, doing this over and over and over again for a number of years, I would also uh, take that into, you know, um, uh, into a test environment with more complex organisms. And I would, I would have human beings uh, volunteer you know, for me to take readings off them. And we would do readings like uh, thermal uh, you know, gradient changes across the skin and also you know, galvanic skin responses, different kinds of millivolt fluctuations. Um, I use a number of other uh, very special tools um, to monitor internal changes. Um, I also would track uh, various uh, celestial bodies in the sky. Um, now, I know basically how alternative science tends to get branded as either a miracle or as kooky pseudoscience. And I know full well that some of the researchers in alternative science, if they do discover something that is real and works um, and might have a big effect, that they're not always treated terribly well and sometimes some rather unsavory things happen to them. So um, I'm going to uh, tread as diplomatically and as, um, as mindfully as I can uh, through much of the subject material. Um, and I'm going to try and package it in a way where the skeptic and the New Age um, fan uh, can digest it in a, in a way that is suitable uh, for them. But let me just say this. First of all, I, I'm not an astrologer and I don't... Uh, believe in astrology, blind faith-wise. Um, seven years ago, I was probably one of the biggest skeptics of the entire field. Um, however, uh, since that time, uh, I've had to encompass a lot of different domains to um, come up with the results that I've come up with, scientific-wise, and, and also, to some degree, esoteric-wise. Um, and what I found, personally, subjectively, is that it seems as though astrology, although I would say a, a, you know, a percentage of it is probably not much more than wives' tales and fiction and wishful thinking, there is something I found in there that seems to have a very scientific nature to it, a uh, real merit. And this is basically uh, observation of cyclic natural phenomena over time done for well, millennia. I mean, you've had a bunch of people crawling around for a long time watching natural events and having correspondences with planetary bodies. Um, that wasn't enough for me. When I was doing my research, I also needed to be able to have at my disposal scientific studies that showed some kind of correlation between angular relations and movements of planetary bodies on behavior. And so I came across Gaclin's work, a uh, French scientist who documented and corresponded um, occupations to supposedly aspects in natal charts um, and, and so there, there was another, I can't remember his name, but he was an engineer that worked for some place, like a, I think it was maybe AT&T and so what they found was that over the course of a year their communications networks would get interrupted, they'd black out and it would happen somewhat repetitively but also chaotically and they didn't know what to do so they brought this guy in and he certainly wasn't an astrologer, he's an engineer very practical, and he said what he found out was that when certain planets um, were at given angles to each other, there was some kind of energetic wavefront that was tangibly, physically coming in, impacting the planet, and literally putting stressors 
on the medium of the network so that it would fail. And apparently, in his estimation, what he, what he found was that it was, uh, in most cases, the smaller, more fast-moving objects like Mercury, you know, the Moon, um, that were the greatest stressors. But he found that planets like Mars or others were at real hard angles, hard angle being like a 90 or 180 degree uh, relation to others, that these physical um, discombobulations would occur in the network. And, um, and so his recommendation to uh, his client was to provide a kind of novel shielding against these emissions. And so they did that and the problem cleared up. Uh, so if I consider that a biological organism is a much more sensitive and fragile uh, kind of receiver of incoming actual physical cosmic gradients, energy, then chances are pretty good that um, the body is going to respond more than like some kind of hardwired, not so sensitive communications network. So what does that do to our consciousness? It's said that the stars impel, but they do not compel at least this is what an astrologer would say. And what that basically amounts to is put enough pressure on an organism and you can bias behavior in a given direction as a trend, generally. Um, we know that the pressure, density, volume uh, in the body of, of liquids changes as the moon uh, goes across its you know, orbit. Um, so uh, we would have a different, very measurable pressure density liquid-wise in the body um, during full moon as opposed to, you know, half moon or quarter moon or, you know, that sort of thing. We can measure it real time. So when we've got, like, the lunatics running around at the, you know, full moon, uh, probably chances are um, their behavior is being affected to a significant degree because there's a lot of pressure on the cerebral spinal fluid. Something's driving them crazy, and it's pressure. So when I take a look at all the different planets... And, um, and I map, map them with a tool that I've created. I, I've created uh, a version of something called a biodynamic antenna array. And that lets me trace um, and extrapolate uh, objects moving across the sky. And when I map uh, representational forms of the gravitic, magnetic, inherent natural RF radio frequency emissions, other kinds of emissions of a given body, and I plot those as an incoming wavefront, and I also take uh, a series of measurements of internal rhythms, biological rhythms of an organism, and I have both these wavefronts uh, represented in the model interact with each other. I get something that I've come to call the percolation zone. It sounds kind of silly, and there's probably a better word for it, but basically just imagine if you had incoming cyclic different patterns of cosmic radiation that are actually hitting the planet at any given point in time, and you have a complex set of internal biological rhythms occurring within a human being, when you take these two uh, complex waveforms and cause them to merge at an interstitial um, intermediary plane, what happens? What is it? What does it mean? Now, obviously, at some point, if these things are coming in from the atmosphere and they're going into our body, then we're going to have the physical sensation of our own internal rhythms. And this, you know, like an example, circadian rhythm. You know, we already know that this is inherent bodily rhythm. We have all these different kinds of rhythms in our body. And we're subconsciously aware of it. Um, but our body also becomes aware of these incoming uh, cosmic radi you know, gradient uh, energetic you know, forms and signals. And, and then our body reacts to it. So we've got reaction or we've got internal incoming, and then reaction, experience. So inside the body, inside consciousness, you have this energetic plane that is almost like a canvas of a new hybridized uh, form. And this form is, um, has different kinds of characteristics uh, in the sense that it will have similar general properties shared over a demographic, but it will also always affect an individual in a slightly different way. A good example you could say, uh, concept-wise, if we take a look at snowflakes, well, we know that snowflakes are, are virtually always different. There are, they, you know, no two snowflakes, they say, are ever alike. And yet, all snowflakes share very similar properties. They're hexagonal at the core. Um, they all have crystalline you know, filaments. So we have shared properties that are common, 
and then uniqueness. And so when these things come in and affect us, same basic thing. Um, and so what I did then is I would study that interstitial plane. I would study the plane of the process of the organism reacting to incoming energies blended with, it, with its own. And I took that data, and, and I'm skipping over a lot of, this, a lot of aspects of the science because I don't know how much time we've got.